Um, so, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next short paper. Um, this is uh, Vasanthi. Hello. Hello. There. Um, mm -hmm. And she's going to be talking about knowledge, the invisible weapon in a pandemic. So, without further ado, I shall pass you over. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Hope that people can see my screen. Just, uh, okay. All right, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vasanthi Elder. I'm currently on secondment to NHS England to work in a COVID cell. Uh, I'm an NHS librarian by background, working for Northumbria Healthcare in, in Northumberland. Now, during the pandemic, a number of specialist cells were set up at a national level at NHS England to work effectively to, to, in the fight against COVID. Now, opportunity arose for me last year to apply for a secondment for a COVID cell called the Behavioral Change Unit. Just click on that. Right, okay. Um, so it's quite a complicated um, slide there. So the Behavioral Change Unit, or the BCU, is the vision of uh, Professor Matthew Cripps, who's the Director of Sustainable Healthcare at NHS England. Now, it's a unique and dynamic team bringing together of experts from different fields to provide evidence-based support for the national response to COVID. Now, their approach included areas of expertise. So there's behavioral insight, clinical insight, and process engineering and knowledge management and having experts from all those fields. Um, the, uh, it brought together a multidisciplinary group comprising of clinicians. And so that included doctors, pharmacists, AHPs, nurses, as well as academics, healthcare managers, librarians, and project managers. As you can see, it had four key pillars, the structure of the unit had four key pillars of which the knowledge management was, was uh, uh, um, part of, uh, was one. So it was interesting to be part of a unit that placed knowledge management at such a prominent position. So it was a really good opportunity for me to input knowledge and library skills into the heart of supporting the fight against COVID. This one. Right, so just to give you a sort of an idea, so these were the kind of main areas where the knowledge team supported uh, in, in the BCU. Uh, I was the knowledge manager for the unit and I had two information specialists like librarians in my team. Uh, we were invited to participate at the start of various projects to offer support. So this included many COVID related projects such as patient information. So for example, how to target public messaging um, like asking people to avoid a &E, or increasingly, or in, sorry, interestingly, later on in the pandemic, how to encourage people to seek help if they need it, as people were starting to become, you know, people were, were becoming too hesitant about coming to hospital or contacting their doctors. So it was actually to sort of reverse what they'd been told at the start of the pandemic. And then another example was a project where uh, I worked with a group of orthopedic consultants and AHPs around the, around the country where they were wanting to create a consistent message and advice to patients who were on Im immunosuppressant medication. So for examples about vaccines. So it was kind of interesting to see how the projects like this develop. So you'd see behavioral scientists being brought in uh, where they would look at the wording around the, the um, um, patient information and say, well, actually that can be misinterpreted, that isn't clear enough, and, and so on. And then some of the work that I would be doing would be looking at how best to target patient information to make it um, um, uh, useful for them. Uh, and and uh, we were also helping, I was also helping to provide the evidence base for new ways of service delivery, such as oximetry at home or hospitals at home, where COVID patients who didn't have severe symptoms were treated at home and monitored using oximeters. So we had to provide information on how to best engage patients uh, who, so that they complied with their home-based support. So were they IT literate? Was that whole thing too intrusive? Uh, could they still speak to a real person if they wanted to? So all of these things had, had an impact. So um, as a knowledge team, we'd also support projects where hospitals or clinicians might try a new treatment uh, uh, flow chart, you know, the new treatment method, and would want evidence to help conv convince colleagues that it was a better way of working. 
So while the unit's principal area of support was COVID, um, COVID management, we, they also offer support to NHS England and the wider NHS um, about making greater efficiencies so that could be gained in their teams. So this included the concept of kind leadership. So this health and well-being and flat hierarchies and equalities and diversity, uh, as well as making efficiencies through marginal gains. Uh, I won't go into a great detail uh, at this point about marginal gains, but most of you would have probably heard of this. It's about making small efficiencies in multiple areas to make big gains. So look up the UK Olympics cycling team. So they made small gains in, say, diet or something like that, and then it ended up with bigger successes. So one of the unit successes was bringing the marginal gains concept to EDI, which is the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, and we developed this um, EDI toolkit. And the concept of the toolkit was to encourage workplace practices that fostered greater equality and diversity. So I provided quite a bit of support to this toolkit by providing the evidence for various recommendations. So it, it, so sort of trying to, to convince teams that uh, there were benefits to having a more diverse workforce, for example, or uh, there were things like allowing um, more, more time for, for job adverts when they went out so that uh, people who are a bit more hesitant, say minorities or people with, with disabilities or women would consider applying. So you just needed to give them a little bit more time. Uh, and also um, avoiding life allocations um, of tasks and meetings as it was found that uh, some workers did not speaking up or volunteering straight away, but needed to go away and, and think about it. And also, interestingly, I think many of you will recognize this, that women are often given non-promotable tasks, well, such as minute taking or making tea at meetings. So it's how is it to, to, to diversify and, and spread out those tasks where there was a greater impact on their careers. Um, I also looked at things like capturing learning from industry to use um, to use in the NHS. So, it, you know, looking at Google, for instance, because they changed a lot of their recruitment practices to attract uh, candidates with neurodiversity. So they, they changed the process and they got rid of things like psychometric testing. Uh, they paired candidates with mentors and helped them get through the whole process. So it was all about getting that learning into the NHS. Um, so it's, we had to show that we, the KM input bit of it was to show various teams and departments in the NHS that, that you could gain really for your whole team by implementing what are sometimes quite small changes. Another really interesting area that the, the, the knowledge team worked with was workshop facilitations. So I helped facilitate quite a lot of workshops, including vaccine workshops. So these were to find out why some groups were more hesitant about taking the vaccine. So in addition to that, I was also asked to provide evidence for the best way to reach or communicate with various groups of people, such as young people or minorities. So how do you target them? What kind of social media platform do they use? Who do they trust? So it was quite interesting to know that they still trusted healthcare professionals, even in the, in the era of conspiracy theories and, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, GPs and nurses, uh, you know, all the people that they dealt with in, in, the, in, in healthcare were still considered to be trusted. Um, and also interesting to see how uh, we could, as an NHS, support people out there who were constantly facing um, uh, conflicting information. So one example is where we had imams uh, and community leaders saying, actually, you know, that WhatsApp is being used quite a lot to, to spread conspiracy theories, but what they wanted from, the, from us was something um, that was to counteract that health information, trusted health information, but optimized for WhatsApp so that they could then use WhatsApp to spread that, to pass that on. So this whole process, it was really rewarding as I got a chance to meet many people and find out what they thought. Um, you know, they, and they, they had complex needs and, and, and they often defied the regular me, media stoked stereotypes. So it was always interesting to listen to their concerns and not just dismiss them. Right, okay. Um, so this is just an example of, of um, how the, the uh, knowledge 
knowledge team would uh, support a project. So we would get a project ask in the BCU. Um, there was a lot of projects ongoing, which, which, which because of COVID, and um, we would then be brought in uh, quite early on to support that. So as you can see, we would have uh, knowledge management would be one of the areas where we would would have um, uh, support uh, to support a project. So um, due to the nature of the request, uh, most of the evidence searching we did was for grey literature, and the information we needed was not always published, um, such as new research. We sometimes had to contact individuals connected to these research projects prior to publication or use preprint site. Uh, we also had to look at learning from uh, industry or other areas uh, to see whether we could learn and bring, bring it into our projects. So say international examples um, and transferable learning such as um, uh, anything that other countries have done um, regarding COVID challenges. Um, so a normal database searches didn't always come into it because we, we would do them anyway, but we won't always find the evidence we needed from it. So the other area would be, we often have to capture tacit knowledge from experts within the BCU and beyond. So we were quite fortunate in the BCU that we worked with various experts. So we contacted them, often contacted them directly or asked, for, um, asked if they knew other experts or researchers. So we would kind of get them together and, and, and learn from that. Um, these were, we would often do um, after action reviews or fishbowls as well to kind of capture a lot of the learning from uh, what had taken place. Um, and, and also how we presented the information. So it was very different from the searches that I did for clinicians at my trust. Um, databases were not always used. And however, due to the urgency of what we were dealing with with COVID uh, and the type of users we were dealing with, so people who had very little time, uh, often didn't have Athens accounts, or open Athens accounts, we had to uh, provide summaries rather than list just references and often found ourselves in a situation where we had to make recommendations or provide summaries at meetings. Okay. So this is the bit that's kind of the next steps really. So in the NHS, uh, a lot of the COVID cells are being wound down. So uh, the BCU itself came to an end last month. So however, my secondment still continues for the time being because my next journey in KM is about capturing learning during the pandemic. So you would have all heard in the news that uh, the government has now announced that there's going to be an inquiry next year. So my role now is very much create, capturing, cre creating the narrative and capturing learning from the COVID response last year. So it's like, what were the decisions made and by whom? Um, and apart from my own team, so I'm working for the nursing directorate and working within the private office for the uh, chief nursing officer. I'm also facilitating this with other teams in the directorate, like the maternity team. So it says, how are their records being managed? So it's not just pure records management. <coughs> it's so that we can tell the COVID story when, we, when the time comes. So it's making sure that there is a narrative, just building a narrative. So I'm finding that using, <coughs> excuse me, using my library and information and management skills is, is, is now to help others arrange and manage their information so that it <coughs> can be searched or interrogated if needed. <coughs> Excuse me, so that's me really. So thank you very much. <coughs> thank you, it's probably a, a, an apt finish, <coughs> isn't it, Masampi? <laughs> yes, <laughs> enough yeah. talking and perfectly timed as well, thank you. So we've got a couple of minutes before we move on. Um, and I can see there's um, some questions <coughs> in the chat. So if it's okay, I'll, I'll just um, share right. those with you. Um, so Claire was asking, um, she was saying the open access to COVID studies and early preprint um, <coughs> has flooded medical databases um, and, and libraries. Um, and she says, this has caused an issue of duplication. And how has this affected your role? For example, in terms of things like efficiency or quality analysis or evidence analysis. So has it affected your role at all? Um, 
Sorry, I'm just having a little think about that one. Um, it's quite a long one, isn't it? Sorry about yeah, that. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I think some of that is actually, uh, we find that, yes, it has in a way, because, um, you know, there's quite a lot of information out there. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes you find something that has been published, uh, something that's in the preprint side that also has been published somewhere else. Um, some of this I found that at the point where we were dealing with this, um, there was really nothing out there. So I wasn't hugely affected by it. So I found that when I was starting to look and they, they were really, it was a bit of a learning experience for me because when I first started to look, I was searching the databases, the main databases, because that's my default place to go as an NHS librarian. And very quickly, I learned that that's not what they wanted to know. They wanted to know the next bit of it, what's new. And at that time, or in the course of the past year, there was very little in some of that learning. And in time, yes, that has been duplicated and there's more coming out. But uh, those preprint sites were kind of a godsend at the early stages. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you ever so much. Um, I'd love to ask more, but I'm conscious of time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move on if that's okay. But thank yeah. you so much for sharing for Santi. That yeah. was brilliant. Thank you. Mm -hmm.